Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, we're doing another reading of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Nice to be with all of you again. And uh, you can see we've got a few books here behind us. Because we read. Because <laughs> we read. We're, <laughs> we're readers, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Weekly reader. Alright, we're indoors because it's a bit cold. Well, yeah. Um, Canto 3, chapter 15. Alright, we're going to finish the chapter today because there's only two verses. And by Jove, we're going to finish it. By Jove. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so this is text 49 and then last one's 50 and then knock it on the head. Okay. So the chapter is entitled Description of the Kingdom of God. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Okay, text 15, or sorry, text 49. O oh Lord, we pray that you let us be born in any <coughs> hellish condition of life, just as long as our hearts and minds are always engaged in the service of your lotus feet. Our words are made beautiful by speaking of the activities, just as Tulasa leaves are beautified when offered unto your lotus feet. And as long as our ears are always filled with the chanting of your transcendental qualities. Mm. Purple. The four sages now offer their humility to the personality of Godhead because of their having been haughty in cursing two other devotees of the Lord. Mm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Jay and Vijaya, the two doorkeepers who checked them from entering the Vaikuntha planet, were certainly offenders. But as Vaishnavas, the four sages should not have cursed them in anger. There you go. Didn't I say that? Well, actually, the ultimate is that they're both, they were both in the wrong. That's One what. was more in the wrong than other. Not necessarily. <laughs> Well, I just continue though. After the incident, they became conscious that they had done wrong by cursing the devotees of the Lord, and they prayed to the Lord that even in the hellish condition of life, their minds might not be distracted from the engagement of service to the lotus feet of Lord Narayan. Those who are devotees of the Lord are not afraid of any condition of life, provided there is constant engagement in the service of the Lord. It is said of the Narayana Para, or those who are devotees of Narayan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Na Kutashchana Bibyati. They are not afraid of entering a hellish condition, for since they are engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord, heaven or hell is the same for them. In material life, both heaven and hell are one and the same because they are material. In either place, there is no engagement in the Lord's service. Therefore, those who are engaged in the service of the Lord see no distinction between heaven and hell. It is only the materialists who prefer one to the other. These four devotees prayed to the Lord that although they might go to hell because they had cursed devotees, they might not forget the service of the Lord. So it seems both of them were kind of in the same mood of of recognizing they're going to have some kind of reaction for the way that mm -hmm. they acted, uh, a hellish sort of reaction. But it's simultaneously they're both praying that regardless of what reaction they get and what situation they're going to have to suffer in, that whatever it is, just please don't let me forget you. So that's mm -hmm. very powerful. The transcendental loving service of the Lord is performed in three ways, with body, with the mind, and with the words. Here the sages pray that their words may always be engaged in glorifying the Supreme Lord. So they want to always be able to chant the glories of the Lord. One may speak very nicely with ornamental language, or one may be expert at controlled grammatical presentation. 
But if one's words are not engaged in the service of the Lord, they have no flavor and no actual use. The example is given here of the tulasi leaves. The tulasi leaf is very useful, even from the medicinal or antiseptic point of view. It is considered sacred and is offered to the lotus feet of the Lord. <laughs> the tulasi leaf has numerous good qualities, but if it were not offered to the lotus feet of the Lord, Tulasi could not be of much valuable, much value or importance. Mm. Similarly, one may speak very nicely from the rhetorical or grammatical point of view, which may be very much appreciated by a materialistic audience, but if one's words are not offered to the service of the Lord, they are useless. The holes of the ears are very small and can be filled with any insignificant sound. So how can they receive as great a vibration as the glorification of the Lord? So how can they receive? Yeah. So the holes of the ears are very small and can be filled with any insignificant sound. So how can they receive as great a vibration as the glorification of the Lord? The answer is that the holes of the ears are like the sky. And the sky can never be filled up. The quality of the ear is such that one may go on pouring in vibrations of various kinds, yet it is capable of receiving more and more vibrations. A devotee is not afraid of going to hell if he has the opportunity to hear the glories of the Lord constantly. This is the advantage of chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. One may be put in any condition, but God gives him the prerogative to chant Hare Krishna. In any condition of life, if one goes on chanting, he will never be unhappy. Or the opposite, he will be happy. So, like that. So, um, yeah, any thoughts? I like the last line. In any condition of life, if one goes on chanting, he will never be unhappy. Mm -hmm. That's nice. I think at the end of the day, when we have problems and issues, if we look at it clearly, they overwhelm you, <coughs> make you, um, make you, you know, upset and distracted because Krishna gets pushed out the center. To decide while I deal with my problems. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then once all of our once our problems are so called solved, then maybe mm. we can go back to Krishna. Yeah. yeah. But we and the point being that not if I kept Krishna in the centre and wouldn't have him. You'll always have him in the material world. Whether it's through the body, other people, you know, whoever. Mm. But the, you don't I mean I, and I don't say this in a pompous world, but little experience I have you don't um, it doesn't affect you to the to the degree that you have good sadhana and you're focused mm, it mm, doesn't mm, mm. and when that's not there even the littlest things you're like oh you know just yeah we yeah. get shaken so easy mm -hmm. yeah but yeah so it's true mm. I like the point about the Tulsi leaf having, having uh, numerous good qualities but if it isn't offered to the lotus feet of the Lord, then it's not really of much value or importance. And that's, you know, saying that about Tulsi Devi. So if Krishna didn't, if it wasn't for the fact that Krishna relishes and accepts, in one sense, only those things that have a Tulsi on them when offered, if it wasn't for that fact, then Tulsi wouldn't, we wouldn't care a fig really for Tulsi. Just like we've also heard sometimes people say that we're vegetarian. But actually we're not vegetarian, we're prasadatarians, which means Krishnatarians. Krishnatarians, yeah. That's, what I'm... That's how you were told? Yeah. I think Prabhupada's also said this. 
Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. Krishnatarians. Krishnatarians or Prasadatarians. means we take prasadam. If Krishna said that eating chicken and eggs and fish was like a good thing, then we'd probably be doing that. But we can also see that it's not a good thing, and even the medical science is starting to kind of express that in a way that they understand that yeah, part of the problem with things like obesity and uh, even anorexia, because anorexia is a result of someone feeling like or thinking that they're fat all the time or whatever. You know, I'm not a doctor, so please. <laughs> but, but, yeah, what? No, but I mean, that people. I mean, anyway. <laughs> really coming with this. He's on a tangent. Okay, we'll stop. We'll stop. Move on. Thank to you. We only had two verses I today, know. by the way. Even, yeah, now we just finished the first of the two, so I'll continue with the last one. <laughs> so this is the last verse of this chapter, text fifty. Then I'll read the pulpit by pulpit, and then we'll hear the pulpit for half an hour to an hour from him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, leave a comment if you want me to stop speaking. I don't mind. It's okay. It make life easier. Don't, why put that pressure on everyone? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can be anonymous somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Text 50. O oh Lord, we therefore offer our respectful obeisances unto your eternal form as the personality of Godhead, which you have so kindly manifested before us. Your supreme eternal form cannot be seen by unfortunate, less intelligent persons, but we are so much satisfied in our mind and vision to see it. Pop. The four sages were impersonists in the beginning of their spiritual life, but afterwards, by the grace of their father and spiritual master Brahma, they understood the eternal spiritual form of the Lord and felt completely satisfied. In other words, the transcendentalists who aspire to the impersonal Brahman or localized Paramatma are not fully satisfied and still hanker for more. Mm. Even if they are satisfied in their minds, still, transcendentally, their eyes are not satisfied. But as soon as such persons come to realize the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they are satisfied in all respects. In other words, they become devotees and want to see the form of the Lord continually. It is confirmed in the Brahma Samhita that one who has developed transcendental love of Krishna by smearing his eyes with the ointment of love sees constantly the eternal form of the Lord. The particular word used in this connection, Anantmanam, signifies those who have no control of the mind and senses and who therefore speculate and want to become one with the Lord. Mm. Such persons cannot have the pleasure of seeing the eternal form of the Lord. For the impersonalists and the so-called yogis, the Lord is always hidden by the curtain of Yoga Maya. Mm. Bhagavad Gita says that even when Lord Krishna was seen by everyone while he was present on the surface of the earth, the impersonalists and the so-called yogis could not see him because they were devoid of devotional eyesight. Mm -hmm. The theory of the impersonalists and so-called yogis is that the Supreme Lord assumes a particular form when he comes in touch with Maya, although actually he has no form. This very conception of the impersonalists and so-called yogis checks them from seeing the Supreme Personality of Godhead as he is. The Lord, therefore, is always beyond the sight of such non-devotees. The four sages felt so much obliged to the Lord that they offered their respectful obeisances unto him again and again. Thus mm -hmm. then, Bhaktivedanta purports. Third canto, 15th chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Description of the Kingdom of God. <coughs> so we'll conclude there. Next chapter is chapter 16. And it's called The Two Doorkeepers of Vaikuntha, J and VJ, Cursed mm. by the Sages. Dun, dun, dun. So it's getting too much exciting. Yes. All right. Thank you very much for watching. Is that it? No final concluding marks? That's it. Okay. Hare Krishna. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Hare Krishna. <laughs>